I don't think those that you think might be made a couple of minutes ago. Um, this will be uh, the second uh, lecture. Uh, and we, uh, we discussed uh, on graphene. We discussed during the last lecture the role of polar interaction and also some aspects of uh, critical scaling in the system. A work that was done initially with Dan Xi. And now I'm moving on. Uh, towards um, the second half of today's talk to discuss issues like um, hydrodynamic transport uh, in graphene where we use the tools that we have uh, developed. This is a work that was done uh, with Lars Fritz, uh, who back then was a postdoc at Harvard, uh, just like Marcus Müller, both have moved along to Cologne or to Trieste and the studio such a uh, state. And uh, yeah, and next lecture will be on ultrasound dynamics in graphene. Uh, which will close this uh, discussion of this material. On my side, uh, we had already discussed what graphene was and who um, pioneered uh, the research, uh, and that as a result of uh, straightforward type binding analysis, one gets the points uh, with a linear spectrum, and at the appropriate positions, they come in and see, uh, no coming surface and no gap, but coming points. Now, last lecture, Girish Bloomberg asked a question. Now, I know Girish for, I believe, 15 years, uh, which, me. which means uh, that um, uh, I should take everything he says utterly serious, which I always do. Uh, so therefore, his question was, aren't you wasting your time? There's a spinoid interaction that causes a gap in the wonderful Dirac spectrum. And because of this, uh, um, well, it's a wonderful exercise that you guys are doing, but it's rather useless. Of course he's right, as always. <coughs> However, uh, the, the, the size of the gap at the Dirac point turns out to be very small. Now, the uh, Xu Sheng, who actually supposed to give this talk, <coughs> so it's fair that I'm uh, doing this right now here, uh, a couple of years ago, in 2007, I think it was published, but uh, they did a straightforward calculation that fits very well to this uh, conference. Namely, they looked at the pi, the sigma orbitals uh, of, uh, of carbon. And of course, uh, the, the sigma bonds are the ones that form the hexagonal lattice and keep the system stiff and strong. And the pi orbitals are the ones that are responsible for the low energy physics. Uh, if you look at the symmetry analysis of which spin orbit interaction should uh, um, be present in the system, you find it's most easy. P stays among each other that, uh, that it's been orbit indirect. And if you then analyze the Hamiltonian correspondingly, you find that the value of the spin orbit direction is 4 millivolts, which is a large number. Uh, that's, you don't need to, uh, this is just a property of carbon. Yeah? So this is 4 millivolts, which is a large number, and which was at the root of Gilch's comment. Well, you, you're opening up a gap of the size of 4 millivolts. And that is not negligible. These are, what is this, 40 Kelvin? Right? So, um, so below 40, 50 Kelvin, you shouldn't see any kind of gap. Uh, however, this is indeed the value we get at the gamma point. Yet, uh, if you uh, look, project uh, this spin orbit interacting Hamiltonian onto the pi bands that are located near the K points, you find that the effective interaction, I'm, I might have mentioned this either during the talk, I did certainly after the talk was like spin orbit interaction squared, you might find energy, which I couldn't remember, which is actually the energy difference between the S and the P states, which is a large energy. As a consequence, you find that the spin orbit splitting on the K point is of the order of a microelectron volt. And therefore, Girsch is right. There is a gap in the end of the day, and, Dirac, uh, and there are no uh, massless uh, Dirac particles, yet, for all purposes that concern energy scale larger than a microelectron volt, we can ignore it because it's small. Yeah? So uh, I thought it might be fair if one uh, can answer the question during the talk to use this opportunity of several talks to answer it afterwards. Right? What we then discussed, though, was um, that uh, we have a decoupling constant in graphene, which is just the Coulomb interaction, strengths uh, made uh, dimensionless by the division of the Fermi energy and, and so forth is a marginally relevant quantity, therefore it gets smaller as we go to lower and lower energy. And uh, one can, in, in, in principle, repeat this and uh, get this logarithmic correction where we would be explicitly calculated as this one coefficient alpha quarter. Uh, you can go to higher orders, and I've just now given you the formulas. 
what you can find with all those uh, rather complicated looking results is that you can still <coughs> absorb everything in a renormalization of the Fermi velocity. So all many body effects at the end of the day can be written as if they were renormalizations of velocity. And in fact, there's a water density as a charge conservation that keeps the value of the charge intact. Uh, I think in the corresponding quantum electrodynamics for the, uh, problem, there was uh, um, uh, in the um, Russian school when they investigated this, they noticed uh, that already that in many parts of the charge conservation, charge itself, the dimension full coupling constant, uh, actually doesn't renormalize. However, uh, what is possible, and of course turns out to be the case, the dimension less coupling constant here, the fine structure constant of this problem. Good. Um, now, we, we, I mentioned that the experiment that sees velocity renormalization already, and we briefly discussed that, in fact, this is only half of the story. That, in fact, once the equivalent direction gets large, uh, computer simulations and mean field calculations find that at a sufficiently strong, so here we have the number of fermion flavors, we discussed graphene is n equals 4 because of spin and valley degeneracy, that there will be a critical coupling constant when the system enters an insulating state and opens up a gap, not because of spin over interaction, not because of substrate induced uh, symmetry breaking between the two sublevices, but as a spontaneous symmetry breaking to a charge water state. Uh, and uh, computer simulation find that this is actually around 1. Mean field calculation gives us the same result, uh, but mean field calculations actually are only valid in this regime here. Uh, and they actually are qualitatively wrong if you look at how the, the mass basically depends on the distance from this critical point here. This is a genuine quantum phase transition characterized by a non trivial critical exponent. We do not know exactly so far what the universality class really is. Because all mean field calculations that are available don't even give exponents. They give something that we are used to from the BCS theory, yet with a, a distance to a critical threshold critical point. It's a very peculiar be uh, behavior. So this critical point is not understood uh, so far. The opening of uh, a Coulomb uh, gap in uh, the Gerber spectrum, it should be in the reachable regime. And surprisingly, when we go back here, the underlying coupling constant here was estimated to be 2 and should have actually been right here, uh, but it is not. So I'm not, uh, this is uh, some issue that, that still needs to be discussed. So there ought to be some correlation physics in particularly uh, suspended graphene. Of course, uh, what is not clear so far is also what is the phase from the, what's the temperature where this, uh, where this order disappears and uh, whether the experiment was later done about that. Good. Now, um, I wanted to go to, uh, since this is a school, to a technical issue that some students, however, should remember that there are always mind fields around when you do calculations first. And you can go into, run into traps. I want to discuss <coughs> an interesting, at least something that I felt interesting. This is again uh, the, the, the diagram that we looked at earlier that gave rise to uh, the velocity renormalization. And uh, one, uh, natural way to write the system like this as um, something that's linear in momentum and a coefficient which would then be the velocity renormalization of the system. Good. So this is the scalar function, the integral can be written down. Now what I'm doing is I'm just sketching you that it can be calculated. Don't follow the calculation. But uh, clearly what you find is it goes logarithmic in the cutoff. Logarithmic in the external momentum. This is our logarithmic velocity renormalization. You don't do an RG, you just do it by hand. You just calculate. What it tells you is you need to have a cutoff, momentum cutoff, uh, which could be, it's very plausible to, to assume, when you have this linear spectrum stops at some point, one, two electron volts. And you just say, okay, I stop this exercise here, introduce a cutoff. That turns out to be dangerous and in fact wrong, um, which is a very interesting observation, that you can't just always do that. So let's go over this. So what I do here is that there's, there's one here, it's the momentum of the fermions, and this is the momentum transferred by the Coulomb interaction. In fact, I have two choices here. I have a choice to either cut off the fermions, which means I have a Dirac spectrum that just stops somewhere. Right? The spectrum is just linear, and then it stops. The density of states goes up linear, and then it stops, goes down to zero. The other option is I can just say I have a Coulomb interaction that goes like one over R, but at short distances it may just shallow. These are very different physics scenarios, it turns out. 
And uh, we will find out it has implications that you can measure in optical spectroscopy. You the man who measured something, Dimitri Basov, and uh, the results that are obtained in those measurements can make a difference which cutoff procedures you write on. Good. So let's do this. What I'm doing is I'm looking at this diagram and I say, let me just switch this integration by a little piece in the integration variable, which I call lambda, some arbitrary number, times this momentum, here which is the external momentum. If the integral is completely convergent, that shouldn't matter, of course. Now, what I've, if the integral depends on the cutoff, what I should do is I should also switch the cutoff. Then I just do mass. But I don't want to do just mass. I want to keep the cutoff unchanged after that shift. That's mathematically not allowed. But it shouldn't matter if the cutoff procedure was irrelevant. By this trick, we can find out whether the cutoff procedure is relevant. So we are cheating. We're doing wrong mass. But we should be getting away with that if it didn't matter where we cut off here or here. So once again, what do I do? I shift this momentum by some piece of that momentum, lambda is arbitrary. And then uh, I keep the cutoff here exactly the same. I do not shift it, as I should do following what we learn in school. So if, for example, lambda was 0, then the, I cut off the Fermi momentum. If lambda is 1, then I'm cutting off this momentum, in fact. Right? Then I have a new variable that's p prime minus p, which is exactly this object here, which then has a cutoff. So I can interpolate between these two regimes. So I do the integral, and after a while you find that uh, if you, for example, take one reference, and this difference is a conversion <coughs> interval, you can calculate and it depends on this funny variable. What does it tell us? The way we are, we are cutting off the, 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 the spectrum, uh, let's say, oh, we just forget about those high energy states, matters for the final result. It shouldn't. So there can only be one correct answer, of course. But it's not obvious from looking at this as a result. So what, uh, in a calculation, this led by give rise to a longer discussion, and I don't want to get into this uh, in some detail, but, but I'm quite strongly convinced that the right result is what you get by enforcing charge conservation. Only one of those many results is consistent with charge conservation. You violate uh, simply the continuity equation. Physically, what it means is if I have a spectrum that looks like this, <coughs> Dirac spectrum, and I stop here, the coulomb direction can give me scattering processes where I'm losing carriers, because I've just cut the spectrum off. However, if I cut off my coulomb direction, <coughs> 1 over r and then something constant, this is still a well-defined interaction, and you don't lose carriers by having a just a somewhat modified interaction. So, so then why, why don't you finish it as it, as it is in the battle oh. with the high density? Well, because uh, the Russian would say lean. Uh, so it's because we're too, too, too lazy. <laughs> so, it's not right. the same because it's yeah. exactly the opposite of what we say. It's a huge density of things. Absolutely. But uh, from the, the funny thing is that even the very, 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 very low energy behavior should be independent on the physics. And that is the correct statement. You can show that. But how to arrive at that result? Of course, you can do two things. You can do the honest calculation. Then there's no discussion. Right? Uh, or you try to get away quickly, but then you need to be careful. That's basically the lesson here. You're quite right. The other option, which so far nobody has done, uh, is uh, to just take the Kalbani version calculation thing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, but uh, so uh, I, I will get back to this in a little while. So Before I get there, I want to do, yes. So I also have a question. I mean, oh yeah, of course. I mean, no, I mean, I mean, why is it you need experiments to judge what is the right procedure? No, you do not. <laughs> Absolutely not. You do not. <laughs> Exclamation mark. This is a theoretical problem that you can judge theoretically. However, <laughs> interestingly, there are implications. <laughs> If I just keep this, this procedure arbitrary, it turns out that this quantity lambda carries over in physical observables if you were to calculate them and take it seriously. And then you can independently judge of whether it agrees with the experiment or not. But this is a theoretical statement. And, and of course, charge conservation, I don't need to experiment. But as a criterion, it's a purely theoretical one. So, so but you're saying that if I, for example, do it by right? Yes. And this is an open Newtonian, so. No, absolutely not. I'm saying this is a right Newtonian. 
And if you want to, uh, but in the intermediate stages of the calculation, you encounter divergences. Absolutely the right diagram. No, no, but, but you have to analyze the full Fourier. Okay. I have to do what? Analyze the Fourier <coughs> Fourier to, to put it on the right side. So I guess if you just do the binary expression, right? Yeah. Then it also goes to the right? Because, because the Fourier of the right? the, the what of the, I just simply cannot understand what, what you're saying. Because of the, when you eat Fourier, first one. I the Fourier transforms the Coulomb direction on the left, I think it's a different one. Sure. Yeah. The low energy physics of this problem should only be governed by long distance physics. The long distance physics is correctly captured by the yes. period. It's the right model for the low energy physics. It's the wrong model if you want to study a system at three volts. Good. Number one. If it is the right model, I gotta get the right results. All what I'm saying here is you gotta be careful to get the right results. That's that's really all I'm saying. I thought for school, you might just point out there are traps, right, in life. This is, there was a trap, there were people who had published papers that turned out to be incorrect, and, and discussions, and emotions, and all that, that, that comes with it, right? Uh, and, and that's all I'm saying, but if it's the right model, you just need to solve it properly. And introducing a cutoff arbitrarily is a dangerous thing, that's basically all I'm saying. Before we go there, I wanted to discuss how you can actually calculate physical observables that include those logarithms. We saw that in the velocity, of course, already. If I, for example, want to calculate the density of a given chemical potential, then we know uh, that all these quantities we discussed in the last lecture, that there are scaling relations between them. You can either calculate the density at the physical coupling quantum, which is what we really want to know in the physical chemical potential. Say we do this at T. Or I can do this at the renormalized coupling constant with a renormalized chemical potential is harder that blown up one. But then we need to, since we are rescaling lengths, we need to just appropriately take care of volumes, right? It's a density for so that was b to the minus two, or length scale factors. What we call per volume is just a different one, per area is a different beast. So now, as the, the renormalization group uh, proceeds, at some point this increasing uh, uh, chemical potential will hit our cutoff. And then we say, let's scaling stop now. It's, it's, uh, because beyond this, we will encounter details of the band structure, and all this procedure doesn't make any sense anymore. And we do this, and this defines us a certain parameter of the scaling. This is the calculated dependency of the chemical potential. We can solve for this when scaling stops. And it depends logarithmically on the chemical potential. If we solve this to leading logarithm factors. Well, now we are in business because now all what we need to do is we need to calculate the density at a very small coupling constant because it gets smaller and smaller. In the high density limit, that can be done easily. But so we, you can start from the non interacting problem and can perturbatively correct if you wish so. You get a result. This is a solvable problem. Very small interaction, very high density. <coughs> the real problem is at uh, high interaction and low density where the logarithmic divergence. You do this, you insert your result here, and you get a result for the density. And really, all what matters is that you get the original density with this chemical potential dependent on a non interacting system, and you find that the velocity is corrected by logs. <coughs> and the argument of the log is in this case, the chemical potential is always the quantity that bothers the system most. Had I chosen temperature, so thermally excited states at zero chemical potential, I would have had here basically just a temperature. That's the only difference. And of course, it wouldn't have made much sense. Uh, but the, the, so the, this parameter in the log is always what bothers the system most. So uh, you can proceed and do the same calculation. You can calculate, now we have the density as function of chemical potential. You can calculate the compressibility, either as function of temperature or as function of uh, density. And those were actually measured uh, in, in, in uh, a number of years ago here by uh, Amir Yacoubi's group, uh, and uh, where the compressibility as function of density was measured. This is the non interacting result. This is the result on the substrate that was used, and this is the result uh, that you would get in vacuum. There, there are significant differences here. And by the same token, you can also analyze the velocity renormalization of the magneto oscillations, the data we've shown the logarithms going up. 
earlier. So this is how you would do this calculation. You can also uh, analyze the diamagnetic um, susceptibility or the diamagnetic moment. It turns out, of course, uh, that graphene is diamagnetic. It has a diverging susceptibility, diamagnetic susceptibility of t to zero. The magnetization goes like square root of b, and with square direction, it gets locks. And so this is just the non-interacting case. Where the non-interacting case when alpha is equal to zero, then it has this. Well, on the graph, it was taken from which uh, the this is, constant. This, <coughs> this here is the electric constant 5.5 and 1. And for the non-interacting case. Uh, well, it, all right. it, doesn't it doesn't depend. It doesn't depend. Yeah? So because the dielectric constant only determines the value of alpha. Okay. Yeah. So, so therefore you see here that uh, if you were to have uh, suspended graphene, you should increase the magnetic moment. This is in microampere, uh, in uh, microamperes, uh, uh, so the, the magnetic density. Uh, in, uh, and you get a significant increase in the system. So clearly, uh, maybe one can even use this to, to, uh, to move graphene around because uh, it can be levitated, of course, easily. I don't know. Uh, and this we discussed already. Good. Now I want to move on and to discuss how much you have. You have like uh, 10 minutes. And now I want to discuss hydrodynamic transport with little detour into optics. Uh, so the two quantities that we wish to discuss is on the one hand the DC conductivity and the shear response. The DC conductivity would be nonsense for a clean system if we had a parabolic spectrum. The reason is, uh, in a continuous model, without impurities, the conductivity would be infinite. Because uh, by momentum conservation, the current cannot relax. Form uh, theory or how you wish to call it. This is different in graphene. It is a well-posed question for graphene uh, to uh, to, to ask what is the conductivity in a perfectly clean system. And the reason is that the current operator and the momentum operator are very different. We know this when we do Dirac theory, uh, right? The current operator is psi dagger alpha matrix psi, the, conduct the momentum operator is psi nabla psi, right? They are different objects, and I can physically even realize that an electric field moves electrons this way, holds this way, the zero momentum state. Uh, and momentum stays conserved during for arbitrary current states, yet uh, you can have a finite conductivity <coughs> the system. And another quantity is uh, that you want to understand when you want to study fluid dynamics of electrons. For example, in non-electronics devices, uh, um, you, you, you uh, impose, say, say, a barrier that causes a velocity gradient, and you want to see how this velocity gradient re relaxes. And by this, you can calculate the electron viscosity of the system, something that uh, we felt uh, was quite interesting option, something that you can also measure through, for example, ultrasound absorption. Good. Um, now, we again do the same story as we've just done for the density. Now, the conductivity, you can find conservation laws that force you what exactly those scaling dimensions here are. It uh, uh, can be shown to arbitrary orders in perturbation theory and so forth. So, we have the same story again. If you want to calculate the conductivity function of frequency, temperature, coupling constant, all we need to do is to calculate it at some renormalized frequency, renormalized temperature, and renormalized coupling constant, then the problem is just easier because the problem is more, more weakly coupled. And perturbation theory can be applied. This is what we will do. We will also we will do the exact same also for the shear viscosity. Now there's an interesting observation here. If you look at the scaling dimension of the shear viscosity, it turns out to be very similar to that of the density density. Actually, it's also the same than the actual density. Um, and uh, this uh, is an interesting uh, fact that, for example, if you take eta over s, all those scaling factors uh, uh, will, will disappear. And if, for any reason, which is not the case here, our coupling constant would just try reach a, cup, a fixed point, then eta over s would just be the value at the fixed point and just the dimension is very So this would be a universal ratio at any fixed point. We don't have a fixed point. Or the conductivity would then be a universal function of omega over t and something that is easier to operate from. We don't have a fixed point. Life is different and more subtle here, but uh, just as a reminder, right? If the coupling constant is goes to a fixed point, that's the value we would take at sufficiently low energy. Now, uh, there is an interesting background. Maybe in the last couple of minutes I can comment on that. Uh, 
why we looked into shear viscosity was, of course, motivated by some uh, um, uh, theoretical work <coughs> that was done in the context of the quark gluon plasma, where you have high density Dirac particles colliding, and it looked like it was very low shear viscosity. So, and uh, what people conjectured in this context uh, um, is that the ratio of the shear viscosity and the viscosity is, of course, a universal number, and it's always larger than one of the four pi. This can actually be easily understood. The condensed matter physicist calls this the multi of a regal limit. Uh, but um, the, the, of course, the field theory has a, a, a very elegant way to, to come to grips with this physics. And it's great, right? Um, the way this is being done um, is by using the so called anti visitor conformal field theory duality. I don't understand anything, so I shouldn't be talking about it. Uh, but uh, if you follow the calculation, which are actually rather straightforward, once you know what you, once you accept that duality, all what you need to do is to look at vibrations of the metrics that give you information about the shear viscosity. Because after all, uh, the, 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 the basically the, the external uh, conjugate field that gives you viscosities are fluctuations in the metric. And you can find what the value of the viscosity for that problem is. And you can also, um, and that's a much easier calculation, calculate what's the entropy density of uh, n fermions and n uh, bosons. Uh, and uh, you can take the ratio and you get that result. Physically, what it means is that if you just do a Boltzmann theory, you will get back to that. Uh, that is that the, that the ratio of the share of viscosity over entropy is nothing else but the mean free pass divided by the thermal de Broglie wavelengths uh, of the particles of the mean distance between particles thermally excited, because that's all we have got here, uh, when we're exactly at the neutrality point. So, uh, and uh, we do know that the mean free pass should not be shorter than the distance between carriers in any uh, Boltzmann picture, and therefore the length here uh, should always be larger than a certain number. And that's basically, in, in the conductivity context, something that's been uh, widely explored and called the much of a regular limit, and even though there are also exceptions to that, to that rule, uh, uh, it is uh, interesting that the corresponding analogous behavior is what gives rise to shear viscosity divided by entropy. So there may be the entropy density natural normalization for the shear viscosity. Yes? But how can you use uh, this uh, CT duality? The thing is not supersymmetric with theory here. Oh, no, no. This is a result obtained for supersymmetric theories, not for graphene. Yeah, but why do you use this result here? Uh, okay, this result was a motivation for us to look into the shear viscosity. We wanted to see what would we get for graphene. That's it, right? It was uh, this is a this is a heavily discussed issue in the context of uh, of, uh, of dense uh, fermion systems. Uh, uh, graphene thermally excited is just one of those, and we wanted to see what would we get for graphene. Is graphene a system that has a very small viscosity or very large viscosity? Baby? And by this sense, in, in the limit of, in the Boltzmann theory limit, large viscosity means weak interaction. It's just like large conductivity means weak scattering, right? Because in all those models, the viscosity is dominated by the kinetic energy term of the, of the, uh, of the current, uh, of the momentum of, of the current, of the momentum of, right? not of the coulomb, of the interacting term. So honey is, has a high viscosity, not because of kinetic energy issues, it's because of the direction. Uh, it's, a, it's a classic system mechanics. So the motivation was to see what would we get, period. That's all. And, uh, and uh, that's maybe where I'm done, right? Okay, so uh, another, and I will get back to that. Uh, another motivation uh, that, that, that is, is, the, is the optics in the system where we have, uh, where the optical conductivity, so now if, if you wish to be t equals zero or the small temperature conductivity at finite frequency, gives rise to a transmission coefficient in the system. And uh, the interesting result is, we will get back to this, if you take non-interacting electrons, you can calculate this optical conductivity. It's an easy result. We know that the conductivity is typically the imaginary part of some current correlator divided by omega. For linear spectrum, the imaginary part of that current operator is linear and omega. Something linear and omega divided by omega gives you a constant. That's a result of the linear spectrum in the system, and this constant happens to be, of course, something which is e squared over h, and the coefficient is i half. For n equals 4 spin and 2 Good. 
Uh, if you do this, insert this result here, you get E squared over H and C, which is, of course, now the fine structure constant of the quantum electrodynamics. And that's why it's been uh, discussed that by measuring the, the, trans the transmission coefficient, you can measure, and this approximately is only the approximate knowledge of this number, uh, um, you can measure the fine structure constant, and if you insert the 1 over 137, you get 97% of transmission, and the rest is absorption. So, this, there are experiments here that indeed see the 90%. I have some, this is some more data here, 97%. It's the same with all those, or this is your data, right? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have this, uh, this very strong, this 97% this, uh, transmission and, and absorption by 2.3% in these systems. So why is that interesting? Because what's been measured here is up to the third digit in agreement with the non-interacting electron system. So every sane person would say, well, you can ignore Coulomb direction. And maybe there was some fake effect responsible for this velocity renormalization. Yes? Sorry, I forget the argument. Uh, but th this these is are finite frequency measurements. And yes. the, the result is actually a limiting uh, result as omega goes to zero, is it not? This is wavelengths. So this is higher frequencies. No, but in the next slide, you were showing um, you were showing finite frequencies. Well, at finite frequencies, you will get Jordan peaks because of thermally excited carriers. Yes. Right, but the, but the, the non-interacting result you quote is an omega going to zero. We, we get to that, in we fact. Yes, it's okay. a very good question. But uh, um, here we go. At t equals zero, the non-interacting result is a constant. If you're naive, you could extrapolate this omega to zero, and you find the DC conductivity, which is, of course, wrong. Because here you have t equals zero first, and omega goes to zero next, which means omega is always larger than t. If you do the calculation for the non-interacting system at finite temperatures, you find this pi half is only true for frequencies larger than the temperature. Okay. Yeah, that's your question. Mm -hmm. yeah? Then it drops down, and whatever you lose here are thermally excited carriers that you can freely accelerate because there are no interactions, and they give rise to a Joule weight that has a coefficient t. So Joule response because it's non-interacting. Yeah? Uh, the DC conductivity is this guy. What happens to this guy? Yeah? How is it being brought? The AC conductivity is this. Therefore, the extrapolation of this to zero frequency is, of course, wrong. It, it doesn't tell you anything about DC transmission. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we wish to study, first of all, this high-frequency behavior here, but the non-interacting regime is this one, as we just discussed. Now, what you can do is now is to say, well, if my scaling logic applies, all I need to do is to do perturbation theory in my coupling constant, and then replace the coupling constant by the running coupling constant, which you now it doesn't have the chemical potential, but by the same logic, the frequency as an argument. But the same scaling argument, you scale, you go on to the cutoff, you renormalize frequency, and so forth. So therefore, we know there will be constants and log corrections, and they should be observable, depending on the value of that constant C. So what the, the <coughs> diagram that give rise to C are given here, and this is exactly the diagram that we encountered earlier when we looked at the self-energy and at this funny cutoff dependence business where we got into a discussion whether this is even the wrong theory, right? So, if you carry all of this over, our funny factor lambda enters here. And it actually becomes in quotes observable. Of course, it's not. It's only one correct lambda. But you can look uh, at the... Oh, that's maybe this important. You can, you can look. This is... If lambda is equal to zero, so which will be the result that, in my view, reflects charge conservation, you get the red line. Because 19 divided by 6 pi is almost 0. Lambda 0 or 1? Huh? You said lambda 0. I thought before you said lambda equal 1 was. Oh, let's go back. Yeah, lambda equal 1. Lambda equal 1. 25 yeah. minus 6 is 19. Thank you. Um, uh, so 19 minus 6 pi. So there are several diagrams that don't cancel at all. They have a finite result, but they happen to be 0 0.01. And therefore, the effect, if we just were to take lambda equal to 0, which means 25 minus 6 pi, which, which you get when you cut off the fermion spectrum, right? Then you get this result, which, and that was the only comment, uh, whether this is a theoretical or an experimental statement, which you can then argue doesn't agree with the experiment, at least. Right? 
Uh, and in order to be really sure what we did, and that's maybe my last comment on this, is let's just do a calculation that doesn't depend on any cutoff. So if I were to just deform the interaction, instead of having a 1 over r interaction, I'm just taking a somewhat different interaction. And this problem for positive eta is perfectly convergent, and you don't need to introduce any cutoff at all. If you calculate the individual diagrams for eta goes to 0, which is our limit, they all individually diverge which is at the heart of, use of this problem, but that if you add them up, of course they all cancel, and indeed all the corrections that you have, most of them cancel except for this one coefficient, which is indeed 19 minus 6 pi. So, so therefore, uh, we believe that, unfortunately, optics in this regime is not able to say something about the strength of the Coulomb direction wall. It is able, but it's not able to quantitatively determine it. We will discuss next lecture fast optics result where this uh, will be somewhat different. But for now, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you for the pedagogical lecture. So, questions? Uh, there, uh, there are two other observables in slow optics that can register this renormalization effect that we discussed much more clearly. If you could put a, a, the slide from our work, absolutely. And it was very kind of you to, to include it in your lecture in the first place. No kindness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, okay, so first of all, you can measure BF uh, for using optics. And this, is, this can be measured from this absorption threshold in your middle panel on the right. Yes. And we reported a Fermi velocity renormalization that has been confirmed recently. This is 2008. It's an ancient work by graphene standard. So the other observable that's uh, very directly related, I think, to some things you've discussed is the is this Druve conductivity, specifically yes. Druve weight. Yes. And you can see very clearly, again, in this middle panel, that yes. the Druve weight is renormalized. The conductivity, theoretical conductivity, should go down to zero below 2EF threshold. Yes. It never does, meaning that the Druve weight is uh, diminished compared to simple expectations by approximately a factor of two that we also reported here, and that has been confirmed through direct measurements of the Drude absorption in thin yeah. films of graphene very recently by Feng Wang. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, uh, yes, indeed, velocity renormalization was observed in, in, in that very early work. Uh, what was, for my taste, um, impressive about what the more recent development was that you could show that it is indeed the expected logarithmic uh, uh, and because there were other claims that you could have power law uh, renormalization of the velocities and so forth, and it was uh, that would not be inconsistent with this statement. So therefore, we do learn a little bit more about things more from those more recent data. As far as the, 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 the distinction between collision-less <coughs> and collision-dominated uh, uh, transport is, of course, extremely important, and I will go back to some of that uh, as we in, in, the, in the last lecture. Indeed, the Drude weight knows everything about interactions. The high frequency result knows everything about phase space, right? And if you and, and therefore it is the Drude weight is much more sensitive, and I think uh, the much more adequate way to learn anything about the, the correlated nature of this, uh, of this system than, than the high frequency. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I, I I have a question about your main Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, the exponential dependence is defined for yes. your value. So, that indicates that uh, there is a probability divergence of the ability and the ability of the Absolutely. Alpha. Yes. What's the origin of that? Uh, well, first of all, it seems to be the wrong result. Right, right. right. That but, um, so, the way it works is uh, you write down something that would be an anal analog to the gap equation in superconductivity. However, you have a long range interaction. So, therefore, at the critical point in that mean field equation, your gap parameter is not a constant, uh, but it's actually a quantity that by itself depends uh, um, on, the, on, on the cosine of the logarithm of the momentum. Uh, and uh, therefore, has a very, very uh, funny, funny structure. Uh, and it's this um, very strange spatial structure of what is basically the normalist self-energy of that problem that gives rise to this logarithm. It looks like a possible salts uh, behavior, right? And also, accessibility just behaves like just, just like that. 
Um, but it seems to be truly uh, um, not the right result for the system. And what is the local simplicity? It's oh, it's very simple. You just have you have two atoms in the unit cell, uh, and if they are identical, you have the gap uh, spectrum. And if they are, if you just accumulate some more charge on one and just a little bit less on the other, then charge you, charge. Yeah, it's just charge. Over. So just to follow up on Dimitri's question, um, yes. we were talking about the specific heat last time. Yes. And we had this renormalization factor which originates Correct. from the velocity of the normalization. Uh, I guess I might naively <coughs> expect that that would be the renormalization related to the renormalization of the, the quasi-particle uh, spectral function and also uh, to the uh, positive and true way that uh, Dimitri is talking about. Mm -hmm. Can one just uh, write write something down and and, and put the it spectral be? function you're absolutely right in the in the uh, for the uh, DC transport, yeah. which is ultimately telling us something about uh, uh, the true way as well, right? Uh, right. Um, it's a bit more subtle uh, because here we need to do an actual transport theory, and what we will do is we just solve the Boltzmann equation for that problem, and you can find at least in the leading order, an exact solution. And, uh, and, and there, uh, we, it, uh, it's, it's a bit more subtle, uh, because uh, you can't just uh, take two spectral functions and convolute them to get, get the result. It's just not the right way to do it. Can you get a factor of two? It looked like the velocity renormalizations were, were much smaller than that, and therefore just Mm -hmm. uh, he's, you, I, if I understood Dimitri correctly, he said there's a factor of two in the Druda weight relative to what you would expect from the theory. Close, but it's, it's, it's maybe a little less, <coughs> little, but it's yeah. a significant factor beyond. Yeah. No. And you're referring to the non-interacting theory, right? right? So we would exactly. want to look at the corrections. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there are other effects that are, that are not related directly to velocity we know. I mean, uh, okay. so, so therefore, uh, so there is a result uh, that you cannot capture directly using just single particle renormalization. You need to solve the extra transport problem, sure, sure. And, and then you get something that goes along those lines. But I don't know whether one can actually capture it that in, in, in single particle. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I, I'm a actually asking about the magnitude. Is that? Have you looked at that at all? Do uh, we get effects well, we of that size too? Um, not do that in the Druid, it's, yeah, it's uh, about 40%, uh, 35%. Oh, I misunderstood, yeah. sorry. Okay. Yeah. 